Welcome to On the Brink, a fresh lens to take you and your business to new heights. Hi, I'm Andy Simon, your host and your guide. Our job is to get you off the brink. And these are very fast changing times. And as you know, if you're not agile and nimble, it's going to be real difficult to thrive, but you can. And 2020 is a year that's going to be passed and something post-normal is coming. And the question is, how will we adapt to it? So as you know, I like to bring to you people who I think will give you insights into how not only to thrive during the pandemic, but afterwards, but begin to learn all kinds of new ways to build your agility and really find new ways to change. I know you hate that, but it's a time for change. So today, I'm honored to have Nadia Bilchik with us. Now, Nadia brings all kinds of great credentials to our conversation today. I've met her through the good fortune of being part of Peter Winnick's Thought Leadership Group. And we meet and talk about ideas. It's quite an exciting time. But what Nadia brings to the table is her whole experience in entertainment, in presentation. So let me tell you about her, and then she'll tell you about herself. She's president of Greater Impact Communication, an internationally renowned television personality she is, and a professional who's developing programs to train others to communicate better, particularly in this virtual world. She's anchored and hosted feature programs for CNN International, CNN Airport Network, and Net Television in South Africa, and has reported for CNN Weekend. She was formerly editorial producer for CNN's Weekend Morning Program. But what she brings is her expertise as a professional development trainer She communicates so well, and she's helping others do the same, like you, our listener today. She's, of course, a keynote speaker and author. But I think that today we're all going to be fascinated by what you can learn from both an expert in the field, but someone who's had to adapt as well, just like we have. And so, Nadia, thank you for joining me. Oh, thanks, Andy. And somehow I thought of this, to take yourself off the brink, you have to read Andy Simon's book and rethink. (laughs) <laughs> I do have a new book coming out, Rethink Smashing the Myths of Women in Business. Love it. And, and, and Nadia was referring to my first book called On the Brink, which this podcast is built off of. But I guess I'm always looking to help people change. So whether you're on the brink and have to soar or you have to rethink and smash the myth, uh, it's time for us to, I don't know, help you do what you hate to do, which is change. And that's mm. what it's all about. I, as you know, I usually ask our Yes. What about you? What's your journey? You so get- it's been fascinating, Andy. My journey from South Africa started in 1997 when I left a primetime anchor position there and came to Atlanta, Georgia. And I was very fortunate because I handed my demo tape. Yes, we had demo tapes then to the head of security at CNN Center. And that's a story in and of itself. And he handed my tapes to the head of the CNN Airport Network. And within a month I was anchoring for the CNN airport <laughs> network. But I tell people, you know, moving countries and continents and sides of the road is not easy. And I did that in 97. And what do you give up most when you move? You give up your network. And I had to reinvent myself and start again. And I know for many people who are joining us today, they've had tremendous change in their lives, be it, you know, kids leaving, divorce, moving cities, moving jobs. But when COVID hit in March, I almost had post-traumatic stress syndrome because my whole world, which had been built up of this wonderful speaking career, within a week, everything was canceled. And for a moment, it triggered that feeling of starting again. And then I had to regroup and tell myself that it was different because I had built something up. But I think for a lot of people, that moment of panic, can really be very traumatic in that it can trigger positive past experiences of uncertainty. So that's what happened for me in March. I had, you know, 24 hours of, am I starting again, again? And very fortunately, I quickly learned to adapt to the virtual world um, and found somebody to teach me how to Zoom and sync my Zoom with my Outlook. And interestingly enough, I was interviewing my brothers and my sister who are all physicians about COVID. And I did a recording like you're doing now and put it out on all my social media. And a company who was of concierge physicians saw that 
And so my first talk was talking to a group of concierge physicians via Zoom on how to come across well on virtual platforms. Wow. So <laughs> that was my very rapid transition from a moment of panic to galvanizing very quickly. You know, you're mentioning something though I want the listeners to remember and that's serendipity. Is it smarts or is it luck as we move through our life? You've had anything, everything's come together because you've listened, you've opened, you've been open to it. And there was serendipity at the airport. There was serendipity on the doctor talk. How interesting, isn't it? So how do we make our life move faster and forward? So what did you learn as you started to do these virtual presentations? Because it's transforming you, I bet, in ways that are really profound. So a couple of things. First of all, having spent three decades of my life in front of a television camera as an anchor and presenter and reporter, I realized I had transferable skills. And the reality is you may not be in front of a television camera, but we're all in front of a webcam. So I quickly realized that I understood this and I could use that. So part of the transition is saying, what do I know? What can I use? So that has been so helpful is saying, okay, it's a webcam, not a television camera. But a lot of the skills that I applied to being on a television camera work for a webcam. And rapidly using that to teach, to train, to help people on their virtual platforms. And what's so interesting, Andy, and I'm sure you've experienced this, is that people think all we need to do to come across well virtually is turn on our camera. And there's so much more skill because so much of organic interaction is lost in the virtual world. So I started to decode what is lost. What is lost is that if you and I were doing this interview in person, we'd have a cup of coffee, we'd chat, we'd comment on the surroundings, we'd chat afterwards. And how do we include that into our virtual world? So that's what I've started to see more and more of. And it's quite interesting because in March, it was okay if you didn't look that great on your Zoom call or your WebEx or your Adobe Connect. I would say fast forward nine months, there's an expectation that if you're going to build real trust, real rapport with your customer, your client, your colleague, your team, you have to have mastered certain things. So one of them being, and you're doing it so well, is just eye contact. You know, something I've been helping people with over the last period is just locating the camera on either your computer, or your separate camera, and taking your eye line and looking directly into the camera. People don't do it. Candace Bergen was on CBS Sunday two weeks ago, and she was so close into her camera, <laughs> and she wasn't looking into the camera, and I did a video <laughs> around it. But there's Candace Bergen, and you're going, is it going to impact her career? Probably not. But it was very distracting for me. Yeah. So I've spent a lot of time over the last nine months just creating programs and keynotes and sessions around using the virtual world to engage, to lead, to collaborate, and to build trust. And both changing mindset, but also just some certain hardcore practical things you can do. But you know, this is new, and the human brain hates the unfamiliar. Poor Candace Berkman was trying to figure out how to do what she always did in a new way, but it's new, but it's not that new, um, right? As you're thinking about it. So well, it's new for her because, you know, she's used to television cameras. She's used to having a crew. I was used to having a crew. <laughs> it, it was new for me to set up my own lights, to do my own streaming broadcast. That was new. But, you know, you speak about that so much. The brain doesn't like change. We know that. I mean, just try brushing your teeth with the other hand. Just try when your ways tells you to go a certain way and it's not the way you think you should go. There's always that decision. Do I listen to the ways or do I go my old way? Because instinctively, we don't really trust the new, do we? No, and in fact, your brain's amygdala hates it. It flees it, it fears it, it's unfamiliar. You know, I, I'm at risk with it. So everything in the world for the last nine months has been brain hijacked. You know, it's like, no, this can't be true. No, we can't do it that way. But you know, communication, uh, eye contact, you know, if you don't know how to lift your computer up, you're looking down. Correct. You even know you're lifting down and it requires us to do it a little bit to see it eye contact, you and I are having a conversation. 
um, for those listening don't know that we're having a conversation as if we're almost in the same room, but not quite, we've gotten past that. Uh, but, but we also need to be listeners. And I think the listening part, because if I want to say something, I gotta somehow cue in an idea that I wanna say something so that she will pause in her thought and I will say something. If not, it's a monologue. And I don't think Correct. she will a monologue. Correct. So you bring up two important points. Number one, I am not looking at Andrea right now, which means I'm missing out because in order to look at you, our audience, I have to look into my camera. If I look at Andy, I'm looking down Right. which is easier for me because I see all her body language and I see her nuances. But for you, as the viewer, you don't feel like I'm looking at you. <laughs> so it requires a skill set. And what I've been teaching people to do is look into your camera when you're talking to the audience. But I use my peripheral vision to glance down at you so that I do see your body language and I do observe when I should talk and when I should wait. But yeah. I'm not having the natural organic interaction, I'm having to concentrate so much harder yes. because the counterintuitive to look into the camera, it's much more intuitive to look at the person you're speaking to. But if I only look at you, it's that. <laughs> well, those who are listening don't see us, but I promise you, if you look at the video, you will. The interesting part, and I say this you know, humbly, is that I've done 250 podcasts over the last three years. Um, and some of this I have uh, adapted as we've done our, as we've moved from just audio to video as well. And it takes time to begin to develop those skills. But in some ways, like your weekend, people had to change from one moment to be completely remote in another. And that many of our clients have had difficult times getting their staff to turn on the video for staff meetings. And my poor client is it has 70 people and they all come on in dark screens. So he's talking to dark heads, dark screens. And he says, what do I do? And they say to me, well, I don't want to be seen on the video. Well, they really say, I don't know what I'm doing on the video. I feel incompetent and I don't want to look stupid. So in some ways, there's an audience who needs your training. Are you doing a little or a lot of this? Oh, I'm doing a lot of training. And it's been interesting and because I've been training physicians um, this morning, I spoke to a group of interventional pulmonologists uh, on why it is important to have your camera on in meetings. And I've spoken to pharma reps, and I've spoken to Home Depot store managers, and I've spoken to, I mean, just Coca-Cola and Home Depot and Porsche and a variety of different companies and people all navigating the same thing. So what I suggest to people, it's difficult to demand that people have their cameras on because to your point, there's a level of discomfort. So what I've been trying to do, and I spoke to a group of lawyers about this recently, is first of all, understanding why it's important to have your camera on. So if everyone else has their camera on, you having your camera on is synonymous with showing up. I'm here, I'm present, I'm showing up. And so if we help people understand that it's in their best interest, they're not doing it for you, they do it for themselves. Yes. Because we don't have organic exposure of coming into the office and seeing people. So by not having your camera on, you're missing out on that exposure. And then if you are going to have your camera on, maximize it. So put your lighting in front of you. Something as simple as what you're doing now so beautifully, have your lighting in front of you. Because what happens is we have a window or a light behind us. Then we look like a cardboard cutout. So I like to say like we're in the witness protection program, right? And we want to see you. So educating your team that them showing up in the best possible light, literally and figuratively, is important for their image and their exposure. And sometimes there needs to be a shift because people go, I just don't want to have my camera on. It's too arduous. And I do this test with people and I'll do it with you right now. I say, how would you rate your webcam confidence? So is your webcam confidence a one? You like having it on like you do now. And I've seen Andy in many virtual meetings now. You always look professional. You always look groomed. You always look well lit. And there's a sense of joy around you. So that's a high. I'm happy to have my camera on, number one. Medium is... I reluctantly put my camera on. It's touch and go. I hate what I look like on the camera, but I do it because I think I should. That's medium. And low is 
don't ask me to put my camera on because it's torturous. <laughs> so I want to help people go, look, you might not love it, but for the foreseeable future, communicating virtually with your webcam on is going to be part of your life. At least have the tools to do it well. Doesn't mean you have to love it, but every single person, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a manager, whether you're a team member, you want to show up like you would well at a meeting. You and I in the world of communication training, part of a career, let's think about it, it's your performance, your technical capability, your performance, your image, and your exposure. We call that the pie. And you can have the best technical skills in the world if you are not seen to be a team player, a leader, positive image, exposure, who knows about you? Who do you have connections with? So we talk about the pie and having your camera on, showing up well on virtual platforms is critical for your image and enhances your exposure. So I say to people, you can't really afford not to do it. Now, that doesn't mean, Andy, you have to have your camera on every single time. There have been times where I'm absolutely exhausted. I've met you in person, and we're now having a follow-up. We might do a phone call, fine, or I'll have my camera off. But for initial meetings, I always recommend people show up with their camera on, well lit, with a good, clean background. I think the how-to is extremely important. But I'm also thinking about our higher ed uh, clients, um, you know, a bunch of higher ed clients and healthcare clients and service industries, but the higher ed folks have to teach the next generation about all kinds of things. I had a, a client and he turned his entire college university overnight into a virtual remote learning. He's making more money than he ever did when they all came onto the campus. <laughs> He's sort of fascinated by the faculty who now find this Good. The faculty don't quite know how to deal with it. They don't know how to do training over the, um, the, the, the web. And the students are figuring it out probably faster than the faculty are because they're, they're hanging in there and they're doing well. But this is a whole generation. And even in the younger schools, my granddaughter is taking her entire middle school year remotely. You so have a granddaughter who is well. Yeah, That's a whole other conversation. So how is she showing up? She's just loving it. She likes it even better than being in the classroom. There's no distraction. So now when she does her virtual platforms, is she on camera or is it only the lecturer who's on camera? I don't really know. But, you know, again, we need to teach everybody. So in communication mastery, what we really teach is that, as you say, and you said it so perfectly, that your presence is as much about how you come across as listening to others and engaging others. So... All of us, whether we are a student participating in a class, a lecturer, or a CEO, that there's two aspects to all communication, right? There's the verbal, there's what you actually say, and there's the nonverbal, how you say it, and how you show up. So if we just educate everybody that in order to be more effective, more impactful, we need to be conscious of the what. What am I saying? But equally, conscious of how and if we are on a phone call and you can't see me then the voice becomes what and how right yeah if we are texting or emailing the words become the what and the how but if we're showing up on camera there is a huge part of the how that is what you look like in your video call so and that's so basic what I'm saying how I'm saying it and I know you do a lot of leadership training and you work with a lot of individuals and you help people realize their potential. And part of that is having the self-awareness and the skills to master the what, the messaging, but also using the how, which is everything from energy and body language and eye contact to show up as the best versions of themselves. And it's remarkable because I have been doing presentation skills training and media skills coaching for years and years and years. And I actually, now that I think a good story to tell you is when I was in South Africa and I was had a business show, I'd find that you'd have these people, CEOs particularly, they were great in person. Suddenly you put a camera in front of them and they froze. So that's how I got involved, right? Is yeah. that I started to say to people, let me give you some coaching tips. 
so that you can be as comfortable off camera as you are on camera. Yes. And the same is true now about virtual platforms. People who are very spontaneous and good in person are not using the virtual platforms to be as engaging. They're not listening. Yes. And you keep emphasizing listening is that if I am a facilitator of a meeting, I have to be very conscious that people on a virtual platform may not speak up. So am I using that moment to say to a quieter member of my team, you know, Mallory, we haven't heard from you. And I know you're an expert in this area. So making people conscious of how to use virtual platforms for engagement is absolutely critical. Even something I was saying to physicians, physicians who are doing telemedicine, they need to look into the camera if they're looking at their patient, right? Yes. Then they move away to another screen and they forget to tell the patient what they're doing. So a patient thinks they're losing interest in me or they look down at their notes and the physician doesn't say, I'm looking down at my notes. <laughs> we need to tell people what we're doing because they can't see and it doesn't make sense. Another tip that I've been giving leaders is, or anyone who's in a team, because part of this whole pandemic has been that people are going through a lot. So if I want to say to you, Andy, how are you doing? Well, Andy, how are you doing? But if I say, Andy, I've closed the door and you lean into the camera. So if you're listening, you lean in. And if you're watching, I'm showing you lean into the camera and just go, Andy, I've closed the door. I know this is a tough time. How are things going? And ask the person, of course, it's got to be sincere and it's got to be authentic. But really engaging people and remembering that this virtual world is not natural. It's interesting, Nadia, because... I, years ago, I did CBS uh, Sunrise Semesters. I bet you may remember those. And I did three of them, uh, 27 programs each. And the fellows who were behind the camera at one point said to me, you know, you're really good, but smile. <laughs> and we're among us. And if I smile, you just smiled. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I'm so serious that, and, and little, little triggers like that. But what I'm finding is that I've had several clients and senior, senior folks cry to your point they are so emotionally drained that the ability to be there i'm going to say their therapist at the moment they're um they're a sounding board uh, yes, yes a comforter yes and and we had to talk through the to them this wasn't rational i mean the emotions had just fallen apart and so I say that to you because I've had some of these clients for a little time, some a long time, but it's not one, it's lots. And I'm finding that the need to be able to open up and share the pain of being, feeling not competent is okay. Um, not knowing how to build that team that they used to do by walking around is challenging. Um, all the things that you had perfected before and made you successful feel less than competent now. And as I'm listening to you, I want to remind the listeners that it's okay to be fragile at a time when you are, and it's okay to shut the door and say, can I just vent? Can I just cry? I just am, and, and it comes spontaneously. Um, and and I, I, there's almost nothing I can do other than hug remotely and smile a lot and, tell, and begin to get them through the journey of pain because it's a journey and they come out the other side ready to go back in, but they need a few tools to work with. Okay. So just simply being there is fine and listening is fine. But if you're a therapist helping those others, you need a few tools to help them not feel so incompetent. How can leaders not feel stupid? And, and I think that's stupid. so that's so much of why you are so good at what you do is to understand that your team, your colleagues, your clients are human. Yeah. And to treat them as such. And, you know, there's a couple of areas that I've focused on in my speaking training career. The one has been presence, you coming across as an influencer, as powerful, as persuasive. And the other is networking and relationship building. And to really build relationships, to really build relationships with people who become your allies. Yes. You have to be a go-giver as much as a go-getter. And what does that mean? That means that sometimes I'm giving by just listening to you, by just hearing what you're going through. And I like to make my sessions 
about shift in mindset, but also some concrete tips. So a question I always say, everyone has got three phases of their lives. We've all got a past, we've all got a present, we've all got a future, right? So if you run out of conversational <laughs> ways to go and you run out of conversation, just remember past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. And asking people, you know, what's your biggest challenge right now? That's a question about what's going on right now. And then you, as person might share something very deep. I'm dealing with an ailing mother, child, parent, difficult teenager. Or you might just say, oh, my biggest challenge right now is that my internet isn't fast enough. And then it's up to the person. But by asking that question, so there's two questions I've been asking during COVID. The one is, you know, what's your biggest challenge at the moment? And I mean, I've had people really say, suddenly they find it very difficult to live with their significant other. Yes. <clears throat> Well, and that, that's not, I mean, on the other hand, I've never spent so much time with my husband in 52 years. And? And we're having a ball. That's so a, well, that's a good news, but I do think. That's good news. So that could be the question, you know, what's the one thing about COVID that's worked out for you? That's true. And I've had some clients that I've done executive coaching with who have discovered that they and their spouse or their partner actually have lots more in common than they, one is, is buying a boat together. They had fought about for a long time. <laughs> and, and all of the things, so and you and I are positive people. Uh, so I always try, while well, the challenge could be, there always is, what is the one or two or three things that have really been good? Because gratitude, positivity, you know, you can collaborate with your mind. And if you want it filled with pain, you got it. But if you want to think about what's positive, think about the 10 things last year that really were good. And of those, really, what do they tell you about how much you were able to do even in a time of great trouble? Yes. You know, I reread Viktor Frankl's book recently, Man's Search for Meaning. Oh, wow. That's and Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor, psychotherapist, and he speak so eloquently about what you've just said, which is that we make a choice every day in how we look at a situation. And just reminding yourself of how critical that is when our external situation is uncertain and is beyond our control. What is happening in our inner worlds? And, you know, you just put that so well. I also love what Brene Brown said. She said, it's not joy that makes us grateful, but gratitude that makes us joyful. That's correct. And, you know, again, for you and your, your work, as you said, it's, it's grown over this period well, because you've seen the opportunity. Yes. But, you know, there's, um, th there is all the new that's been able to be leveraged, whether it's Peter's group of strangers who come together once a week I'll never meet those people, I don't think, in person. Oh, this is, Andy's referring to this mastermind group we have of thought leaders. Uh, but I don't know if you know that one of the members, Klaus, once a year, he takes people to Poland to experience, he takes the experience of connecting to a new level. So, Andy, you and I may meet in Poland one day. <laughs> I would be delighted if I get on a plane again. And Ilya, a uh, member of the group, wants to go back to Greece where I did my research. And um, But that's the kind of folks who came out of nowhere to create something of great value. I thought you were going to mention Klaus's new um, Global Thought Leadership Institute gift that has emerged from this. And that's the part about mm, change that it can either be lemons or lemonade, limes or margaritas, and it's all about you collaborating with your mind. So as you think about our talk today, and I'm going to have Nadia talk about a couple of things she doesn't want you to forget. I don't want you to forget serendipity, that things are going to come along you haven't expected or planned for. We're really not in control, even though you should take care of what's in control. We really, it's an illusion. Um, and the second part is that the things that are happening can be lemons or lemonade. It's all in collaborating with your mind. Do you want to see the positive and turn it into something bigger? Or you want to focus on things that are painful because it's not what you used to have. But remember, too many of my clients tell me that what they used to have wasn't so great. Mm -hmm. But it was comfortable and familiar and your brain remembers it. It was familiar. But was it good? I don't know. The old was better than the new. Why? Because you're not familiar with the new? Mm, let's practice a little. Now these mm -hmm. are the things you'd like our, our listeners to not forget. 
to remember. What I'd like you to not forget is that we are all communicating virtually and that there's certain things you can do to master the medium. And that is to go into every virtual interaction with a mindset of one being fully present. It's so easy to multitask. It's so easy to put your camera off and multitask. Be present in the same way you would in person. Then remember eye contact into the camera. When you're speaking, you can glance down. Have your lighting in front of you, not behind you. Have a background that makes a statement or says something, but isn't distracting. I like virtual backgrounds, but make sure that your virtual background is appropriate. And then follow up. So if you are in a virtual meeting and you are meeting someone virtually for the first time, do something that Andy did today, which is then arrange a separate opportunity to get to know the person. Yes. Because real relationship building is a connection, a conversation and a collaboration. And to get to collaboration, you have to go beyond the initial. So just a couple of things that one can do to make the most and be conscious in every virtual interaction. And for those of you who have been listening or watching, Nadia and I spent a little time having coffee beforehand, not really, but we would have liked to have a little coffee, yes. maybe a little sherry, and we would have had just begun to know what it was that we wanted to share with you today, because this is as much a shared collaboration of ideas as anything, and that's what makes it so wonderful. There are 130,000 of you who come every month to, to listen to us, even from South Africa, where Nadia is from. And it is a very interesting time where things that we never might have done before are sort of almost simple and easy. Sharing globally with people who have similar needs anywhere. Nadia, if they'd like to engage with you or get to know you better, where is the best place to find you? So very easy. My website is nadiaspeaks.com. And always feel free to link in with me, Nadia Bilchik. It's been a pleasure. I can't tell you what fun I've had today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to Andy Simon for always making me rethink. <laughs> for all of you listening, thank you for coming. Send me your emails at info at andysimon.com. They always bring me new people that you would like to hear. And that's why we're here. Remember, my job is to help you see, feel, and think in new ways so that you can change because change doesn't come easily and we do hate it. On the other hand, never waste a crisis. It's not so terrible to begin to think about what did I learn this past year that I can really leverage for next year and begin to turn lemons into lemonade. But if you're not sure how to do it, don't be bashful, get a hold of Nadia. She'll begin to show you how to use this new medium or media in ways that can really benefit you and those who you are you know, sharing with or, or performing with. Now to my new book, Rethink, Smashing the Myths of Women in Business comes out January, 2021. It may be already out, but I think Nadia's podcast may be before then. What I'd like you to do is think through all the different ways that you can help women become the best that they can be. What are those? Well, you see something, do something. You don't like the rules, change them. You hear something that's not appropriate in your office, that's biased against a gender, you can do something about it. Whatever it is that today will help women become the best that they can be, you will benefit from, and they will as well. And the most exciting part about the book are the 17 year old girls who are beginning to see other women who have made it, and they haven't made it because of anything special. They just had the tenacity to overcome the hurdles. And when people said, oh, women do that, don't do that, they said, of course we can. And so, you can get it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and all those local bookstores, and they just enjoy everything online today. It's simple and easy. Thank you, Nadia, for being with me today. Thank you, Andy. Everybody stay well, stay happy. We're very grateful for you. Bye-bye now.